Welcome to the 98th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Volodymyr Vovchenko from the Institute for Nuclear Theory, University of uh, Washington. Uh, he received his PhD in 2018 from Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main in Germany. Then he was a research associate at uh, Frankfurt for until 2020. In 2020, he went to uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where he was a postdoc for two years. And since uh, April this year, he is a research assistant professor at the Institute for Nuclear Theory, University of Washington. Uh, he had several awards over the years. Uh, between 2000, uh, in 2018, he received a Gersh Excellence Award for the outstanding doctoral thesis in Frankfurt and uh, a prize from the Associ Association of Friends and Sponsors of Goethe University for Young Scientists. Uh, in 2019, he received Ferdinand Linen uh, Fellowship of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And this year, as I just learned, he received Young Investigator Award from International Union for Pure and Applied Physics. His research interests inc include QCD theory and phonology, heavy ion collisions, neutron stars, scientific computed, uh, computing. He also worked a little bit in condensed matter physics. In heavy ion collisions, which I believe his main uh, field of research, he was studying phase structure of QCD, equation of state, fluctuations of conserved charges, freeze out physics, particle productions, and perhaps many other things. And today he will be talking about QCD phase structure from fluctuations of conserved charges. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Volodya. Mm -hmm. So th thank you very much, Igor, and it's a great honor to uh, give this uh, talk here at this colloquium, this series which I myself enjoy very much, both live as well as uh, recordings, and I hope I can make a, a very good contribution to the series myself as well. So I will talk about what uh, we can learn about the QCD phase structure by using fluctuations of conserved charges and uh, mostly in the context of heavy ion measurements, measurements in heavy ion collisions. And this is the uh, summarizes some of the uh, results obtained during the last few years. Uh, so I will start with a brief introduction and the, the general motivation is a, is a pretty simple one. I think uh, we are studying, uh, we want to learn about the structure of QCD at under extreme conditions. For instance, uh, to uh, formulate this question, one can consider the phase diagram of QCD in temperature and biochemical potential variables. And this is uh, the figure taken from a review article for the Rigby Energy Scan uh, program. And uh, actually, even though you can see different phases on, the, on this sketch of the phase diagram, most of the things shown here we don't really know. So what we really know about the QCD phase diagram on one hand, from first principles, we have the equation of state vanishing barrier chemical potential. So under conditions where the number of particles and antiparticles on average is the same, uh, we have a lattice QCD method applicable there, which does not suffer from the sign problem, and it has provided us with certain results. We also know um, empirically properties of nuclear matter at low temperatures and uh, around the normal nuclear density. Uh, from the uh, various observations and properties of the theory, we also expect to, at very high temperatures and densities, to have a partonic matter, a quark gluon plasma, on one hand. On the other hand, uh, at very at, at low densities and temperature, the uh, confinement stipulates that we must have a hadronic matter and something akin to a hadron gas. And so one uh, key question is, uh, what is the nature of the transition from these two regimes, which we expect QCD to, to have. Uh, this transition, it could be a smooth transition, as we already learned from lattice QCD for vanishing barrier chemical potential. But in principle, this can also be a, a real phase transition, uh, like a first order phase transition. And if that is the case, for instance, that will imply the existence of a QCD critical point in the phase diagram of matter. But where it is located and whether it exists at all is a question which has not yet been settled. And therefore, this, this structure of QCD remains still unknown. 
Um, so how to study the, the phase structure of QCD? So the first principle, that is QCD method, which I already mentioned, involves solving numerically the QCD equations on a discretized space-time grid. And at zero chemical potentials, we have a finite temperature, that is QCD results, which provide us with the equation of state of QCD as function of temperature. And this is uh, how the equation of state looks like. What is shown here are the basic thermodynamic variables of QCD matter at zero chemical potential, such as pressure, energy density, and entropy density. And what we see here is a smooth transition uh, from a behavior which is uh, which is which resembles that of a, a gas of hadrons and resonances. And we can put this statement more quantitatively by comparing the calculation within this model with lattice data. And on the other hand, at high temperatures, it, it, it is consistent with, uh, with a slow approach towards the Stefan Boltzmann limit of non-interacting quarks and gluons. And the transition is a smooth one. It does not show any singularities. And the characteristic temperature of the transition is of the order of 155 MeV. This is the uh, so-called pseudocritical temperature of QCD transition at zero chemical potential. Uh, but as far as finite baryon densities are concerned, then we have the lattice method has a problem. It's called the sign problem, uh, which, pro which prevents this uh, straightforward sampling of lattice configurations uh, due to the fact that the, this so-called fermion determinant becomes complex. And so you, don't, you cannot interpret this quantity as a probability distribution anymore, as was the case at zero chemical potential. Therefore, direct lattice methods are unapplicable. And, and thus, lattice so far does not answer the question, what is the nature of the transition at finite baryon densities? Uh, many effective QCD theories, on the other hand, predict this possibility that the transition turns from a crossover type to a first order phase transition. And thus, this implies the existence of the QCD critical point. Uh, and, but where is it located? Does it exist? It's still an open question. We can still try to learn something from the first principle lattice method by uh, performing extrapolations from the axis of zero biochemical potential and see if the, because if there is a critical point nearby would be equal zero, there should be uh, some influence at observables at mu b equals zero, which are which can be calculated on the lattice. And in particular, what one can do is consider the Taylor expansion of the QCD pressure in the variable of biochemical potential scaled by the temperature to make it dimensionless. And the coefficients of this expansion, they are so, so the so-called baryon number susceptibilities, and they are calculated at zero chemical potential. Therefore, they are accessible in lattice QCD. A number of leading order coefficients have been now computed. And by looking at this coefficient and on the convergence properties of this truncated Taylor series given by these coefficients, one can uh, try to see if there is a singularity, which a QCD critical point would be, which uh, affects this expansion. And then if there is one, maybe it's, it's an indication that there could be a, a critical point. Uh, however, the analysis so far do not see uh, evidence for the critical point and the, the soft statement uh, which comes out from this analysis is that the existence of the QCD critical point in the range of mu b over t less than three is disfavored from this analysis. Um, alternative approach uh, is uh, would be to study uh, another kind of expansion, the so-called relativistic virial expansion, which is an expansion not in the mu b over t, variable, but essentially in fugacity. So it, relativistic version uh, implies expansion in the hyperbolic cosines of mu b over t. And uh, at imaginary chemical potential, at imaginary chemical potential, uh, the lattice method is still free of the sign problem. This expansion has the uh, form of a Fourier series, and therefore the coefficients of the expansion can be, can be computed. And then the convergence properties analyzed as well. And the analysis also shows that uh, the expansion sees a certain singularity in the mu b over t complex mu b over t plane, but this singularity is located in the complex plane, not on the 
real axis where the critical point would be located. And therefore, the statement coming from this type of analysis is basically consistent with the analysis of the Taylor expansion that the existence of the critical point at maybe over t less than roughly pi is disfavored. And therefore, critical point, if it exists, is likely located beyond the reach of the presently available lattice QCD methods. Um, therefore, uh, on the other hand, uh, one can probe QCD matter not only from, not only purely theoretically, but also in the laboratory and by performing experiments of relativistic heavy ion collisions, because uh, colli collisions of uh, nuclei accelerated to ultra relativistic energies create highly excited QCD matter. And uh, by varying certain basic control parameter of the experiment, such as collision energy, this range is what is currently accessible by the available accelerators. One can probe different, uh, one can probe the QCD matter under different conditions, like different values of baryon density as well as temperatures. And uh, what is ultimately measured in a heavy ion collision, which is sketched here, are the final abundances and momentum distributions of, of hadrons as well as uh, their uh, more differential. Uh, observables like higher order moments to which I will come shortly. But just to uh, motivate further why heavy ion collisions can be a suitable tool to study uh, uh, thermodynamic properties of QCD matter is to just, is because we can literally see that these uh, events create thousands of particles, relativistic heavy ion collisions. And this makes it natural to think and apply concepts of statistical mechanics to this kind of system. Uh, so the, the easiest, uh, maybe perhaps not this, but the most basic thing one can first look at is to see what are the uh, relative abundances of various hadron species coming out of a heavy ion collision. And a number of them have been measured, in particular, lots of charged hadrons like pions, kaons, protons, as well as hyperons have been measured in a broad range of collision energies. And if uh, the collision creates a, a, a roughly equilibrated QCD matter, which expands and eventually freezes out. Then one can apply a simple thermodynamic approach to describe these abundances by simply uh, using thermal distributions for relativistic hadron gas. And this uh, type of model the, called the thermal model would have a very few free parameters which one can fit at the uh, to the experimental data, like temperature and biochemical potential. And this uh, approach works relatively well to relative accuracy of something like 10, 20%. It describes a lot of various hadron abundances at essentially all collision energies. And by performing this procedure at each collision energy, what one can do is to essentially map heavy ion collisions at various collision energies to the QCD phase diagram. And what is shown on the right is a compilation of T and mu B values extracted at various collision energies, starting from the highest collision energies available at the LHC and going down to, to the energies probed by other programs like rig beam energy scan, SPS program, as well as AGS and Hades. And interestingly, the uh, temperatures extracted from, from this kind of fits, at least at high energies, appear to be close to the values uh, characterized, which characterize the QCD transition at zero chemical potential indicated by the by lattice QCD. And this gives certain hope that uh, heavy ion collisions indeed probe matter, which is possibly sensitive to this uh, QCD transition. And therefore, if there is for example, a phase, first order phase transition and the critical point somewhere at higher values of mu b, then the data uh, coming uh, from collisions at those which probe those regions might be sensitive to the critical point. And what is uh, and what kind of observable could be sensitive to the critical point? Uh, well, to think about this, one can uh, remind of a phenomenon of critical opalescence known uh, for many years in atomic physics. 
Uh, and basically what happens near the critical point is that uh, is that it's correct it uh, large fluctuations of densities which reach macroscopic length scales occur there and for example um, the crit the associated with that phenomenon of critical op uh, opalescence is that when you have a fluid which is normally uh, transparent to irradiation by a laser near the critical point due to this very large fluctuations of the densities, it becomes opaque. That the the instead the there is scattering and and no longer uh, transparency occurs. And this kind of experiments maybe some of you have even seen in the in, in basically in the university uh, physics courses lab. I certainly remember seeing this illustration in my course. The problem for heavy ion collision, however, is that um, we cannot do this kind of uh, procedure in heavy ion experiment because there is no way for us to, to trap this excited blob of QCD matter created in heavy ion collisions and then shoot lasers on it. What we have is that the system is created for a very uh, short period of time and then it expands and then the only thing we can look at is, is the distributions of various hadrons. Not to mention that the number of particles and the size of the system is much smaller than than in this than seen in this kind of uh, experiments in atomic physics. On the other hand, what we can do in experiment is we can basically count all the particles in each event. Of course, with with some issues like efficiency and detector losses, but nevertheless, essentially we can track uh, this finite number of particles created in heavy ion collisions. And then what we can do is, is to build this distribution histogram of various of the distribution of the number, of, for example, of protons created in heavy ion collisions and look at various characteristics of this distribution. And one particularly useful characteristics is given by the cumulants. So the cumulants is just a way to characterize a distribution and, and it, here is a generic uh, definition of, uh, of cumulants through the cumulant generating function. And cumulants are just the Taylor expansion coefficients of the cumulant generating function. And if you look at the number of the leading order cumulants, they characterize some of the uh, basic features of a distribution. For instance, the first cumulant is just the mean of the distribution. The second cumulant is the variance. The third, Cumulant characterizes the asymmetry of the distribution around the mean, and the first cumulant characterizes the shape of, of the peak. And so these are the, the, the leading four cumulants. But what is particularly relevant and interesting here is that in statistical mechanics, the cumulants are sensitive to properties of the equation of state. And to see that, what one can do is to consider the structure of the log of the grand partition function this has this following sum of the over the canonical partition function. And if you compare it with the definition of the cumulant generating function uh, listed here, then you can see that uh, this implies that there is basically identical structure, which implies that the cumulants of a distribution of, a, for example, conserved QCD charge like baryon number is nothing else but the derivative of the log of the grand canonical partition function with respect to the chemical potential. And therefore, cumulants measure chemical potential derivatives of the equation of state. And so they are sensitive probes of the equation of state. And this is the basis, basis for a number of applications of fluctuations and of cumulants um, in QCD. Uh, the most relevant for this talk is the search for the QCD critical point, because uh, the presence of the critical point implies large fluctuation of baryon number near the critical point. And in particular, one can near the critical point, one can introduce this concept of the correlation lengths, which in infinite system formally diverges at the critical point. Uh, but the cumulants themselves are proportional to increasing powers of the correlation lengths, which means that they exhibit singular behavior and this singular behavior in a way becomes even more singular when you go to higher and higher orders. And in particular, based on this purely equilibrium uh, uh, arguments, uh, it has been predicted that if there is, for example, a critical point here on the phase diagram in the vicinity of the so-called freeze outline in the heavy ion collisions, 
then one can expect some sort of non-monotonic behavior uh, of the first order cumulant of the kurtosis of proton number as function of collision energy. There are also other possible application of the cumulants, like for example, uh, at mu equals zero, this, the cumulants are accessible in lattice QCD, which show deviations from the limit of uncorrelated uh, hadron gas. And therefore measuring this type of deviations, for example, at the LHC in principle could be a, a test of equilibration and, and a test, experimental test of lattice QCD predictions for the, for the chiral crossover transition at mu equals zero. And another uh, interesting possibility is that the fluctuations and the cumulants can be used as a, as a complementary way to study freeze-out conditions, right? And to check, for example, whether freeze-out extracted from fluctuations is consistent with freeze-out extracted from mean hadron yields. Uh, and I would like to also to remind that mean uh, analysis of freeze-out on using mean hadron yields is based on phenological model of hadron resonance gas, while freeze out using, for example, cumulants or conserved charges calculated in lattice QCD could, it would in principle be a more model independent approach if done properly. But let us uh, focus on the critical point and just to illustrate these statements about sensitivity of fluctuations to so the critical point here I'm showing a model calculation of a phase diagram for nuclear liquid gas transition, where uh, I'm showing various cumulants uh, as function of T and mu B and, and how they look like in relation to the, yeah, to, to the line of the first order phase transition of nuclear matter and of the liquid gas uh, critical point in nuclear matter. So the density is, is what we usually see. There is a discontinuous jump from gas phase to liquid phase, and this jump becomes a continuous a smooth transition when we are above the critical temperature. But now if we look at fluctuations, then we see that the uh, ratio of second to first order cumulants is the so-called scaled variance. So the variance normalized by the mean number shows uh, large fluctuations and divergent behavior near the critical point. But when you go to even high order, higher orders, like the third order, this so-called skewness of baryon number distribution, then you not, you, you not only see the singular behavior near the critical point, but you also see patterns and structures, like the fact that skewness is negative in the liquid phase, but it's positive in the gas phase. And then the kurtosis shows this even more sensitivity and more non-monotonicity, like large values around the uh, phase transition, and, and but also large negative values in the crossover region of the liquid gas phase transition. And so this is just a motivation how in equilibrium run canonical thermodynamics, fluctuations probe very well the critical point. Another illustration is a, it comes from a microscopic model calculation. And here, um, it, what is shown is the classical molecular dynamic simulations of a Leonard Jones fluid in the uh, along the essentially critical isotherm of the liquid gas transition, which is present um, in that system. And, and what is nice here is that here that this is a microscopic calculation. So we do not enforce equilibrium by hand and, and you basically look at fluctuations of particles as they are. And to be more precise, what was done here is simulation in a periodic box. And because in the simulation, the total number of particles is conserved, right? To, to, to study fluctuations, what was done is that uh, a subsystem was taken and fluctuations of particle numbers, which, uh, which due to diffusion change in the subsystem were studied. And, and what is shown here is the variance and the variance, which is corrected by this factor one minus alpha, uh, just to be brief, one minus alpha is a correction for the fact that this subsystem where you see the red particles is in contact with the heat bus, but this heat bus is not infinity. This heat bus is also finite and its size is comparable to the size of, of the subsystem we study. So this factor just corrects for, for that. And what we see is that um, from this molecular dynamic simulations, when we are far from the critical point, for example, at densities significantly below or above, 
uh, the fluctuations approach the expected value we, the, uh, from, from the grand canonical ensemble equation of state. And uh, this uh, therefore means that the analysis is consistent. But what is even more interesting is that when we do simulations near the critical point, near the critical density, where the fluctuations are predicted to be large, like in this for this particular simulation, scaled variance of about seven. So the variance of the distribution is seven times larger than the mean. In molecular dynamic simulations, we see large finite size effects. So we can have simulations even with 25,000 of particles. We still do not quite reach the value we would expect in infinite system. However, if we talk about enhancement of fluctuations generically as a signature of the critical point, like for example, enhancement with respect to unity, which would be a baseline of, of a Poisson statistics, then we see it even for system having only 400 of particles. And therefore in this idealized example of a box simulation, uh, essentially fluctuations work as advertised. They they increase when you approach the critical point and can be used as its signature. But now let us go to, to the reality uh, of heavy ion collisions. So in heavy ion collisions, as I briefly mentioned before, what is done is that uh, we count the number of events with a given number of, of uh, whatever variable we use for fluctuations. And basically what is used are fluctuations of a net proton number as a proxy for uh, the net baryon number. Yeah, it's very difficult to measure neutrons because they're neutral particles and not bent by magnetic field in heavy ion collisions. Therefore, we use protons as a proxy for net baryon number. But uh, measurements for net proton distribution have been performed. And this is the illustration of how distribution of net proton number actually looks like in heavy ion collisions at various collision energies from beam energy scan program. So from square root of S 7.7 .7 GV to 200 GV. And these distributions look on the first glance fairly innocent. You just see some peak. Essentially, if you don't look too close, it looks almost like some Gaussian distribution, maybe Poisson distribution. But if you look at the tails of the distribution, then you can see deviations from that picture. And deviations from that picture can be characterized again by by calculating uh, cumulants corresponding to this measured distribution and then analyzing their behavior. So this is what has been done. And, and usually what has been done is that we look at the ratios of cumulants because in this way, we, we can remove this trivial dependence on the size of the system. So we then look at the so-called intensive variables. So these are the compilation of the measurements uh, from uh, here from Rick B manager scan, as well as from uh, one point from fixed star fixed target program, as well as from Hades experiment. And this is the measurement for the kurtosis of net proton distribution, the ratio of the first to second order cumulant. And the data show possible indications for a non-monotonic collision energy behavior. And even if we look again at this, uh, prediction based on equilibrium thermodynamics uh, as a possible signature of critical point in that picture, we can see that actually it, one could imagine that there is something like that. Um, however, there are issues uh, with interpretation of the data, which I will cover, cover uh, in the coming slides, but also even if you take seriously the presently available error bars for these points from the lowest synergies in rig beam energy scan, where it seems like the most interesting stuff could be happening. These error bars are too large to really say much at the moment. Uh, but the data from beam energy scan 2, which has larger statistics, will be able to address this particular issue of the large error bars. Um, but this will come in the future. So what I will focus on now from here on is that, of course, we have not only the kurtosis, right, the first order cumulants, but we have measurements for the lower order cumulants, kappa 2 and kappa 3 as well. And these measurements, which sometimes don't get enough attention, in my opinion, they are already much more precise than, than, than these 
points for the Courtois. And therefore, we can ask a question whether we can learn something already now from these measurements. But in order to learn something from these measurements, we have to confront the reality of experiment in comparison with the theory we have discussed so far. And the theory we have discussed so far is, has basically been a, a QCD block in contact with the ground canonical heat bath. So we basically, we discussed coordinate space. We discussed system which can exchange freely conserved charge like baryon number with external heat bath. And it's uniform and it has a fixed size which does not vary. These uh, assumptions do not really hold true in experiment. We cannot measure particles in, directly in, in coordinate space, but we only can do perform cuts in momentum space. And so if we want to have a handle on coordinate space, we have to do some sort of correspondence between the two. The system in heavy and collisions, it's not in the contact with the heat bath, it expands in vacuum. So for example, this implies that if you have 400 baryons colliding, then you will have 400 net baryons in the final state, no matter what, no matter whether you are close to the critical point or not. And therefore you have to emulate the heat best somehow in order to, 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 to see these fluctuations, signals of the critical point or something. Then there is the issue is that we are using proxy observable for a conserved charge in QCD like baryon number, we use net protons. The properties of the system can be quite different. For example, whether you're looking in the central rapidity region or whether you're looking at forward backward rapidity region where, uh, the, where the matter, for example, has a larger baryon number than at mid rapidity. And in heavy end collisions, it's impossible to fix the size there is always uh, fluctuations of geometrical origin of, of the system size, and we can do centrality selections and perform corrections, but it, it's something which, which cannot be controlled to 100%. And therefore, the bottom line is that to, to, to analyze experimental data and make conclusions out of it, we need to, to have a more involved theoretical modeling and something like a dynamical description of heavy end collisions. And so there are various, in that regard, approaches to the search for the QCD critical point using dynamical models. For instance, ideally one would uh, incorporate critical fluctuations associated with the critical point directly into uh, the hydrodynamic description of heavy ion collisions. And this would entail modifications both to the hydrodynamics by implementing the critical modes in the description and also uh, an important ingredient of of hydrodynamic modeling is the equation of state of QCD. So if we want to have critical point and fluctuations, we need to have equation of state, which is consistent with that notion and has a tunable critical point, which we can, for example, put in some location in the QCD critical phase, uh, into QCD phase diagram and then make predictions dependent on its location. So there is a, a large effort going on to, uh, to, to make this kind of framework under has been under development within the beam energy scan theory collaboration, and, and this will continue further on. At the moment, uh, there is, it is not in the shape to quantitatively analyze experimental data just yet. Uh, another approach could be using molecular dynamics with a critical point and maybe exploiting this um, notion of universal behavior near the critical point where one could, for example, use something so, some simplified models with a critical point like the Leonard Jones fluid I described uh, briefly before, but this is also so far uh, is not applicable to expanding system created in heavy end collisions. And therefore what we can instead focus on is to calculate, a, to make a precision calculation of a non-critical reference for fluctuations of net protons in heavy end collisions and then by comparing it with experimental data, see if this reference would be consistent with the data, which would indicate that there is no signal of a critical point, or there could be deviations. And we can then uh, look at those deviations and, and, and see whether this is something one could expect due to critical point or not. In order to do that, one has to 
paste this description on realistic hydro simulation, which is tuned to bulk observable. This has already been available for some time, but one has also to include essential non-critical contributions to proton number cumulants. Basically, there are non-critical effects which, which, which make um, distribution of net proton different from, for example, a trivial baseline of Poisson statistics. And the uh, extension that we consider here are one is the effect of exact baryon number conservation of this fact that I mentioned before that if we collide 400 baryons, we will have 400 net baryons at the end. So this, so any analysis has to be respectful of this very simple, but very strong constraint. And another one is that there are hadronic interactions which are which which do not lead to the critical point, but which nevertheless will influence fluctuations. In particular, there is uh, the nucleon nucleon scattering is known to have the repulsive core at, at short range, and this type of repulsive core, uh, as is detailed in the first coming slides influences net proton fluctuations as well. And so it has to be taken into account. So to be more precise, the repulsive core of nuclear nucleon scattering can be modeled by means of the excluded volume correction. This is what we have considered. There could also be other ways of doing that, but the excluded volume uh, is one of the simpler and controllable approaches to include this, incorporate this effect but what is also interesting is that uh, including this effect is actually justified by latest QCT data we have on net variant susceptibilities. So what happens is when you include the effect of excluded volume for baryons in the hadron resonance gas model is that distribution of baryons and antibaryons, which in the standard model is a corresponds to Poisson distribution, it becomes a uh, more involved than Poisson distribution. There are deviations from Poisson distributions. And if you look at these deviations, for example, in this so-called kurtosis ratio of susceptibilities of net baryon number, this ratio becomes suppressed. And this suppression is something which is also seen in latest QCD at temperatures which you would use to characterize uh, the end stage of heavy ion collisions, like 160 MeV. And we can even fit the parameter to latest QC data for these observables, and we can get a nice description in this temperature range with a baryon excluded volume of about one cubic Fermi. So this has been done some years ago already, and we use this as an input to model the excluded volume effect. So then once we have this, this is a description of of, of our uh, calculation for non-critical uh, reference for proton number fluctuations. So as I mentioned before, we, we base it on three-dimensional hydrodynamic simulations. These hydrodynamic simulations incorporate 3D initial state and parameters which are have been fitted to, uh, to uh, ob bulk observables, observables which are not related to fluctuations like PT and rapidity distributions, for example, of protons and other hadrons. And the simulations are performed using uh, viscous hydrodynamic solver music and consistent with the notion of non-critical reference. The simulations use uh, equation of state, which has a crossover like transition uh, in the whole, uh, across the whole phase diagram. And this uh, equation of state is obtained by interpolating uh, Taylor expansion-based description of um, at high temperature using latest QCD and hadron resonance gas model description at uh, smaller temperatures. Then uh, the hydrodynamic evolution ends at a hypersurface, the so-called Cooper Fry hypersurface of constant energy density of around 0.26 GV per cubic Fermi. And uh, in this particularization routine is where we introduce this new ingredients, non-critical contribution to proton number fluctuations. Basically, when we transform the fluid into particles at the Cooper-Fry particularization, 
we have to respect the effect of excluded volume, um, which we fitted to latest QCD data. And how to do this, one has to, uh, not to go into too much detail, but one has to modify the standard sampling using Poisson statistics by additional rejection sampling step to incorporate uh, this uh, effect of excluded volume that two particles should not, two variants should not come too close to each other. And this is described in detail in this paper. But on top of that, we also have to incorporate effect of exact global variant conservation uh, that we, if we have 400 variants initially, we have to have 400 net variants at the end. This is done via method called SAM 2.0. I describe it in one of the next slides. But this is just in a little bit more detail what is done technically is that we, per, we calculate proton number cumulants from this Cooper Phi particularization. And this calculation is done in two steps. In the first step, we forget for a moment about the effect of exact baryon number conservation. We essentially work in the grand canonical limit. And what we have is that we have hypersurface and across each uh, element of the hypersurface, we have independent emission of particles. This is what grand canonical ensemble is essentially, that we apply it locally. And we, when we calculate the cumulants, we incorporate the effect of excluded volume, and then we incorporate the effect of, uh, of uh, momentum cuts in experiment. So we calculate the probability that a proton emitted from a certain region of the hypersurface ends up in the acceptance. And then we uh, remove, and then we remove the protons which do not end up in the acceptance. And what is done, yeah, uh, to be more precise is that we calculate joint cumulants of baryon proton distribution inside experimental acceptance in this grand canonical limit uh, as a sum of contribution of all elements of the Cooper Fry hypersurface. And, and here are just the details that we do to calculate each contribution that we incorporate the excluded volume effect, that we incorporate momentum cut, and we incorporate at the end this um, the fact that we don't measure all variants, but, on, but only protons. So we remove neutrons as well. And then once we calculated this cumulants, what we can do is we can perform the second step. We can apply this constraint that the total baryon number inside and outside the experimental acceptance is fixed by initial uh, conditions of, of the collision. So uh, essentially what this means is that we have to introduce this constraint into this uh, distribution uh, of variants or more generally variants in proton in experimental acceptance. And without this constraint, we have the grand canonical limit that we have just used to calculate the cumulants. But once we introduce this constraint, this induces corrections. And these corrections can be worked out. And basically, what is uh, by using me the method called subensembles accept acceptance method. And basically, what this method does is it does all the math associated with this Kronecker delta uh, here. And what it does, it expresses cumulants of protons and baryons, which are subject to constraint of exact baryon number conservation in terms of cumulants of protons and baryons, both inside and outside of acceptance, which are not subject to this constraint of baryon number conservation that we have just calculated in the first step. So we perform these corrections and we obtain proton cumulants, which, are, which respect the, the constraint from baryon number conservation. And so with this, uh, we can now come to the results that we have and how they compare with the experimental data. And uh, we cover collision energies from LHC down to Hades with most focus on Rigby-Man energy scan energies. But let us start first with the LHC, for which I basically have one slide here. So there we used a uh, uh, bust wave parameterization of hydrodynamic solutions to uh, heavy ion collision at LHC. And we calculated 
a net proton cumulants with effect of baryon conservation in excluded volume in experimental acceptance of the ALICE experiment where they measured second order net proton cumulants. And he, this is how the results compare with the measurements. This is the experimental data for net proton variance normalized by the mean number of protons and antiprotons. Uh, this measure in the limit of Poisson statistics, so uncorrelated proton production would be equal to unity. And experiments indicate a subtle but uh, but statistically significant uh, decrease from unity as acceptance in pseudo rapidity is increased. And when we compare it with model calculations, what we see is that the data can be described either when we incorporate baryon number conservation in full phase space and neglect effects of the hadronic, sta hadronic stage. Name and the most important effect that is neglected is baryon annihilation. Then the data, this is shown by this orange band, are described well. When we do this, but then run uh, our uh, particles from hydro through afterburner and have baryon annihilations, then we no longer describe the data in this setup. But this agreement can be recovered once we introduce even more stringent, stringent constraint on baryon number conservation. When we do instead of global baryon number conservation in full space, if we consider local baryon number conservation, for example, due to the fact that uh, baryon antibaryon pairs, one can argue, are created locally and therefore baryon number con is conserved even uh, not just globally, but locally, then we can recover the agreement. So at the moment, we have these two scenarios with which experimental data can be explained. And these scenarios can be disentangled by additional measurements of moments of proton number distribution. And just to be complete, there are also measurements of other net particle number fluctuations like lambda, net lambda, net kion, and net pion. And these measurements are not as much sensitive to, um, for example, effects of critical point, at least not expected to be that sensitive, but they are sensitive to some other physics, like for example, correlations and fluctuations that appear due to decays of neutral resonance into pair of charged pions or charged cans, like rho zero or phi, for example, as well as additional conservation laws like strangeness or electric charge. But let me now, uh, turn to rig beam energy scan energies and proton cumulant ratios at these collision energies. And in particular, what we show here is the ratios of net proton cumulants uh, of order three to one and of order four to two. So it's, it's skewness normalized by the mean and kurtosis normalized by the variance. In the limit of Poisson statistics, again, uncorrelated production of protons and antiprotons, these two ratios would be equal to unity. But if we look at the data, in particular, the data for third order cumulants where error bars are smaller, the data clearly establish deviations from this baseline. And these deviations are captured at collision energies above 20 GeV by this non-critical calculation, which incorporates effects of global baryon conservation and excluded volume. This is shown by the solid red line. By the other two lines, we can show also separate when we include one of the two effects separately, but not another. And we see that baryon conservation generally has the stronger effect, but for quantitative description above 20 GeV, we need both effects in. Uh, on the other hand, when we look at lower collision energies, we can see clearly there is excess of in the experimental data over this baseline. And this could be a hint of some physics missing in, in the calculation. And to look at this in a little bit more detail, what we can do now is we can uh, look not just on the ordinary cumulants that I've discussed so far, but also on complementary observables called factorial cumulants. And factorial cumulants is, is, is just another way to characterize a distribution. 
there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between cumulants and factorial cumulants, which one can derive. And basically, factorial cumulants are linear combination of ordinary cumulants, and factorial cumulants have um, this attractive property is that they probe genuine multiparticle correlations. For example, if you don't have correlations like in the Poisson limit, then all factorial cumulants starting from the second order will be equal to zero. Therefore, if you have non-zero factorial cumulants, you have correlations. But also what is uh, useful in the context of critical point is that, is that near the critical point, we the, the singular behavior of the cumulant, it basically sits in the factorial cumulant. So singular behavior of kurtosis sits in the fourth factorial cumulant, singular behavior of the of the skewness sits in the third factorial cumulant, and so on. And so therefore, um, near the critical point, this factorial cumulant should be just as sensitive as ordinary cumulant. On the other hand, if you, uh, when we talk about non-critical contributions like baryon conservation or excluded volume, then actually their contribution to high order factorial cumulants is small. It, it's proportional to this power of, for baryon conservation, power of alpha is the fraction of full space coverage that we have, which is usually much smaller than one, or the excluded volume parameter B for the repulsive interactions. And therefore, if, if we are in the regime where repulsive interactions are a correction rather than some sort of dominant effect, then these contributions are also very small in higher order factorial cumulants. Indeed, this is what we see in our model calculations for third and fourth factorial cumulants. They show small deviations from zero. Experimental data, um, on one hand, they are con the data are consistent with these calculations. On the other hand, at energies like 7.7 .7 GeV, there are still large error bar and Possibly, there is still possibility there could be significant multiparticle correlations. But now we can instead look at the two particle correlations from this point on, because this is where we have statistically significant effect and deviations observed. And we see that two proton correlations in the data indeed show this excess over non critical calculation at energies below 20 GeV while at energies above 20 GeV, they are essentially consistent with non-critical fluctuations. And, and uh, this could be a hint of attractive interactions because attractive interactions would, um, would imply positive correlations between pairs of particles like protons. And in fact, in vicinity of the critical point, these two proton correlations would become singular, they would become very large. And therefore, if, for example, you are approaching, as you decrease collision energy, the region near the critical point, then, then one could very well imagine that we are entering this regime where suppression due to baryon conservation starts to be overcome by this attraction. And then we see this trend in the data. So this is one possible speculation of what might be happening here with the data. And uh, just to dwell a little bit more on this, we can look at even more differential observable and look at this two particle, two proton correlation as function of rapidity cut at various collision energies. And here again, we see, uh, we see a nice description at energies above 20 GeV. We start to see some deviation at uh, lower energy in particular, as rapidity cut is increased, and we see largest deviations at 7.7 .7 GeV. And so again, what could be this interpretation? I mentioned the critical point, but this is not the only interpretation. Uh, one more boring possibility could be the so-called volume fluctuation. So what this means is that when you have the collision, uh, when you so basically when you analyze events in the experiment, you have events which one event and basically every event is not quite like other event. In one event, you can have slightly smaller size of system. In another event, you can have slightly larger size. And, and, and we call this volume fluctuations that, uh, that we have events of different sizes. And if you have vo volume fluctuations alone, these fluctuations will propagate into 
final fluctuations of that proton number that we measure, or equivalently into two proton correlation function. And this effect can be uh, calculated and to leading order contribution of volume fluctuations to this uh, second order factorial cumulant is, is given by this uh, quantity. It's the mean number of proton times uh, V2, not elliptic flow, but uh, normalized variance of volume fluctuations. And so what we can do is we can just try to explain the data at 7.7 GV with volume fluctuation by just fitting this parameter to describe the data. And indeed, you can do this at 7.7 .7 GV with some value of, of volume fluctuation variance V2. However, when you then do this at all other collision energies, if you use the same volume fluctuation at other collision energies, you spoil the agreement at all other collision energies, which makes volume fluctuations uh, not a very likely explanation of, of this deviation. Then one can consider, in addition to baryon number conservation, also other conserved charges, for instance, electric charge conservation, right? Because protons, they carry baryon charge, they also carry electric charge. Therefore, if you have electric charge conservation, that can influence protons. At large energies, this is not so relevant because charge conservation is mainly determined by pions, which are abundant at large energies. But as you decrease energies, you have less and less pions, and then effect of charge conservation in protons can become relevant. However, this effect, what it would do, we have done corresponding simulations in uh, it will decrease further, not very sizably, but it would decrease further this to proton correlation rather than bringing it up to the data. So this is not a viable explanation either. And therefore we are back to this interpretation that possibly when we go to baryon rich matter, by decreasing collision energy, we go into a regime where baryon repulsion turns into attraction. And one mechanism which might be associated with that is possibly there is a critical point somewhere uh, nearby. And then, so what we can do, we can decrease collision energies even further and look at experiments at collision energies below 7.7 .7 GB. There is measurements coming from fixed target program metric, in particular 3 GV point shown here. But even before that, there is also a very interesting measurement from the Hades experiment at GSI at 2.4 GV square root of S. What they measured are very significant correlations between protons. So this is factorial moment of protons normalized by the mean and it's and not only is it not negative, but it, it's it's above one. So what this means essentially is that uh, the variance or the width of the proton distribution at Hades is more than twice larger than the mean number of protons. So this is a very significant deviation from, yeah, from Poisson. On the other hand, one can also extend this non-critical reference below 7.7 .7 GeV, which is also something we considered and, and, and we see no change in trend, basically the this, this quantity stays negative and it becomes even more negative. So obviously the trend in this calculation is very different from the trend suggested by the data. And, and there will be more data coming, in particular filling this gap between 3 GV and 7.7 .7 GV. But what we can do is we can take a closer look at the Hadis data and see if we can try to understand it in some way. So we can apply the same uh, formalism we have used to have this data by uh, parameterizing the freeze out hypersurface at Hades. This type of uh, hypersurface has been obtained recently by analyzing spectra of protons and pions. Uh, and essentially, this corresponds to a, a more or less spherically symmetric hypersurface given by Siemens Rasmussen model with a Hubble like collective flow on top. And then we also um, know roughly to which temperature and maybe in the phase diagram collision, uh, the freeze out at Hades would correspond from analysis of the hadron abundances. So we have all these parameters fixed, but and we can use this hypersurface now to calculate the fluctuations. So uh, we do this in the same way as we did before, starting start with the grand canonical limit and calculate the cumulants. There are there are there is one additional complication, namely 
it had these energies, a lot of protons in the final state are bound into light nuclei, and they are therefore they are do not contribute to proton cumulants measured in experiments. So we have to account into that, and we do that by applying binomial filter to remove protons which are bound into light nuclei. But there is also a simplification at Hadis because we have assumed uniform values of temperature and UB across the entire fireball. Um, what this means is that baryon susceptibilities are locally. Uh, the local baryon susceptibilities are all the same across the whole fireball. And so in the end, the proton cumulants in the ground canonical limit for a moment, which are correspond to experimental acceptance, they are expressed as linear combination of baryon number susceptibilities where this linear uh, coefficients, one can calculate from this by integrating over the hypersurface in a proper way. And what this means then is that we can use experimental measurements and reverse this relation and see what values of baryon number susceptibilities experimental measurements would be consistent with. So this is then what has been done. We fit baryon susceptibilities to experimental data within this fireball model. And we do this here for small acceptances because uh, we are operating so far in the grand canonical limit, so we have to be able to neglect baryon number conservation. So when we do this fits, these are shown by the black lines here. We describe the data very well with the values of net baryon susceptibilities, however, which are which are quite dramatic. So we have this very large scaled variance, even larger skewness and even larger kurtonsis. Or in other words, we have this analysis indicates very large non-Gaussian fluctuations of baryon number, which is needed to describe the data. Yeah, and it exhibits this, this hierarchy of, uh, of scales and, and signs. And naively, this could indicate a critical point near the uh, freeze out of uh, conditions realized at Hadis, because this type of susceptibilities is something one would expect near the QCD critical point in, in equilibrium thermodynamics in the grand canonical ensemble. But the conundrum comes when you look at the experimental data at larger acceptances. So if we extend our grand canonical calculations, this is shown here by the dashed lines, then we, we actually still describe the data pretty well for second, for third order, even for fourth order, if we take and the uncertainties, which are quite large there seriously. But this is puzzling why this should be the case, because we have so far neglected baryon number conservation. But baryon conservation should bring this, for example, the variant down, because in full space, baryon number does not fluctuate. So you should have zero fluctuations if you would measure all baryons. And if we then incorporate baryon conservation in, and we consider a variety of different ways, then basically we essentially destroy the agreement with experimental data at large rapidity cuts, which we had in the grand canonical calculations. Therefore, um, the data, even though it looks very interesting, the data are challenging to understand if we take variant conservation seriously, and this at the moment is, is an unsolved issue. But with this, uh, this now brings me to the summary. Uh, and in the summary, I would like to just describe what I think we learned from fluctuations and heavy ion collisions. Well, first we see that in general fluctuations seem to be promising to probe the phase structure of QCD. And what we see is that uh, the data from heavy ion collisions at energies above 20 GeV are consistent with non-critical physics. So if we incorporate baryon conservation and short range repulsion between baryons by means of excluded volume, then we, we get a consistent description of data above square root of S 20 GeV. So if we describe the data without any critical physics, then this disfavors uh, QCD critical point in that regime, which would correspond to maybe over T values of less than roughly two or three. And this observation is consistent with what we know from lattice QCD and from the constraints on the QCD critical point, which come from this uh, lattice gauge theory. But we, we see interesting indications for correlations between protons, even multi-proton correlations at collision energies at 7.7 .7 GeV and below that, like uh, at 2.4 GeV from Hades. And this remains to be understood, but it, it looks like it can be something interesting. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I will be happy to take your questions. <laughs>
Thank you very much for a nice presentation. Now we'll have some time for questions. Any questions from the audience, please raise the hand and I'll go in the order of those hands. So uh, uh, Agnieszka Sorensen, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name. No, no, that was perfect. So, okay. um, thank you, Volodya, for a very nice talk. Uh, yeah. I have a question to slide 12, actually. So pretty early. Okay, getting there. Sure. Oh, missed it. Okay, the molecular dynamics. Yes. So, um, so there is uh, clearly a dependence of um, whether you can reach the say theoretical limit uh, mm -hmm. for a given value of alpha. And mm -hmm. I understand this to mean that for a very small alpha, you don't capture the relevant correlations. So mm -hmm. the question is whether your correction method is so. Uh, so like certain whether you have such faith in your correction method that this can tell you what length of correlations is important i don't know if you get the mm. question well okay but well, that's true well, the thing is that the correction is derived in thermodynamic limit right mm -hmm. so in thermodynamic okay. limit if you have a finite value of alpha then both system and subsystem are infinite by definition right <laughs> So in that sense, we okay. would expect it to be to reach this limit for any finite value of alpha if you would mm -hmm. have infinitely large system. But who knows? <laughs> Stranger things have happened. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, the next question, um, Rudik Manikandan. Sorry again if. You could say oh, your name right. correctly if I mispronounced. Okay. Uh, my name is Ritik Manigandan. I'm actually from University of Houston, a graduate mm -hmm. student here. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Alodia, for the talk. It was a really great talk. So I have actually two questions. One, mm -hmm. uh, could you go to slide 15, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, this one. Yes. So here uh, you talk about how the laboratory, which is the experiment, expands in vacuum. But mm -hmm. if uh, I make the statement that actually our system is in a path where the path is the longitudinal energy from the collision, would that be wrong? Okay, well, so here, uh, well, I mean, we, we're talking about the whole system uh, of two colliding nuclei, so, and it is in vacuum. But the, so I think what you have in mind is that in experiment, you don't measure the whole system, but you capture certain slice of rapidity around the right. mean center of mass rapidity. And therefore, the rest of the system X can act as a heat bath. Right. Yeah. So I think this is, yeah, this is what we were counting for when originally fluctuations were, were uh, proposed to study. QCD uh, phase structure and and well, it, it, there are corrections to that, right? So basically, uh, if I can back, go back to slide number 12. So there are corrections to that in the sense that it's still not an infinitely large uh, part, this outside the acceptance. So this is, for example, if it was infinitely large, then alpha would be zero here. But alpha is finite. So this is correction to the fact that it's not infinitely large. And another fact is that we have to transform momenta into coordinate space. And in this, so in this sense, if you go to very high collision energies where you, we have Björken flow, then roughly the space-time rapidity coordinate is equivalent to momentum rapidity plus some, some small smearing, well, depending on, on how heavy the particle is. Um, so these corrections can be calculated and they are in, they are incorporated into these calculations shown here. Um, but basically, so th the point is that um, like there are always uh, basically corrections to, to just treating it as a heat bath, right. right? Like in the ideal case. But the idea is correct that we measure subsystem and therefore we have fluctuations and, and we can mimic the outside as a heat bath. And then the second question would be, uh, 
So when you say non-critical physics above mm-hmm. 20 GeV, are you implying that the criticality does not survive in the system enough for us to see it in the final state distributions? Like we are very far from the critical point. Basically, yes. That in that region we probe at uh, baryon densities which are not that far from zero, that, that we are still far enough from the critical point that the influence is, is small. Okay, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, next question, Graziano Milato, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I have mm-hmm. two simple questions. First question, in slide 11, what is meant by gas and nuclear liquid? Is there actually a liquefaction or an evaporation? That is, what kind of properties do the mm-hmm. liquid and the nuclear gas have? Mm-hmm. The second question, what is meant by multiple particle correlations? What kind of correlations are conceivable? Okay, so the so the gas and liquid it, it's it's in analogy to the classical system. So you, you have infinite system. One has small density, other has large density, but the degrees of freedom are the same. It's interacting nucleons. They are uniform system. So the the phase separation, phase transition is all in this coexistence line only. Uh, so there is uh, so it's a uh, basically it's a direct analogy to any classical system you can find like plasma yeah like water like yeah like gases ah, like, like argon water. and so on mm-hmm. yeah only with some oh well with fermi direct statistics on top right so that's the, the difference but otherwise it's essentially the same kind of transition well mm-hmm. it's just nucleon gas and it's not a gas of light nuclei which there is, is probably, no light, light nuclei no, no. probably wrong mm-hmm. in this uh, physically in this low temperature region. Mm-hmm. A lot of the protons will be bound in deuterons and other stuff, and that is neglected here. Yeah, it, yes, this is neglected here. It's So the degrees of freedom are nu- nucleons only. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, okay. Yes. Did, so. did you answer the second part of the question? Yeah, the yeah, second, the, the multi- the... Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, and the, yeah, so the multi-particle yeah. Correlations, yeah. Well, essentially, this is like anything you, you that you cannot describe is, is just two particle correlation. Yeah, there is um, basically, basically, for example, if you think about virial expansion of of or a, or a cluster expansion of the equation of state, then. Uh, to second order, you only need interactions between two particles, but you don't have to consider uh, how third particles may influence the interaction of these two particles. But for when you go to higher and higher orders, then you have interaction. You can have like two particles interacting close by, but you cannot neglect the interaction of third particle on top of that, and so on and so forth. So in this sense, it's basically. Uh, this kind of correlations. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you very much. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Next question, Roy Lacey. Yeah. So, can you? I mean, I want to take issue with the the, the conclusions you're drawing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? So maybe you just go to your concluding slide. Oh, yes. And so, what what I want to say is that. If one uh, analyzes carefully uh, the fluctuations data for finite size effects, what mm-hmm. you find is that you can uh, you you can construct wonderfully beautiful scaling functions. Okay, and those mm-hmm. scaling functions tell you what the critical exponents are. And that puts you in the 3D Ising universality class. And in addition, it gives you an estimate of the, 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 you know, the, the critical value for the root S. Mm-hmm. 
And mm -hmm. that puts you somewhere between, say, if you want to, you know, be generous, somewhere between root tests of 30 and 40 Jev. So I, I, do, I don't understand where, you know, this this conclusion comes from because you know those those observations are not focus focus i mean you know the dominant effect that persists on the fluctuations data is the mm -hmm. effects of finite size now your intuition might have said well finite time effects would also be important but it turns out that you can extract the, the dynamic critical exponent and find that it's very small, which tells you that the reason is because you have this thermoacoustic coupling, which means then that your relaxation time is actually quite short because it travels at the speed of sound in the vicinity of the critical point. At least okay. that's my interpretation. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you, Roy. So I, I mean, so for finite size, effects or, or different centralities. So we have looked at proton number cumulants at different centralities and also in the data. And basically there, what we see both in the data in the modeling that at high energies, they are essentially flat and consistent at low energies in the data. They are not flat in the model. They are flat like 7.7 .7 GV and there we see deviations. And I'm not sure that if you are referring to the same data for, for the scaling of cumulants that you mentioned, uh, but I would be happy to look on that in more detail. And I think that it would, would ultimately it would be good if you can see this type of scaling if it exists in dynamical model simulations. Okay, so, of course, uh, it would be nice to get some of that data set to investigate. Yes, there is no. Mm -hmm. Yes, second no course, way. we couldn't catch what you said. I just wanted to contradict Roy as usual. Professor, I don't, I don't agree with your conclusion. I would just contradict and say there is nothing, absolutely nothing at 30 and 40 GeV. When there is anything interesting, only when you come down into the high baryon density region. So of course, course, a new of 100 MeV or 200 no, MeV. No, 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 no. As usual, we, we disagree. And we yeah, yeah. Agree. But, but let me <laughs> let me explain the difference between. So <laughs> what, what I'm what I'm trying to say here is that when when you do the measurement, even if you saw a non-monotonic pattern, okay, that pattern would be at some pseudo critical point, which is shifted from the infinite volume critical point. And the only critical point which makes sense when you extract it would have to be the infinite volume critical point. And that can be shifted away by, by as much as 30, 40% from the real infinite volume critical point. Okay, so, so I'm just saying that be careful when you say that you are shifted down because shifted down might just be part of the finite size effects. Okay. okay, I think uh, we should move on to the next question. If there is anyone uh, with a question, I thought I saw a raised hand. Now it seems to be gone. So uh, let me ask a very naive, simple question. Uh, you were basically spending a lot of time and effort of analyzing proton number fluctuations. Mm -hmm. although it's only a proxy to the barrier number conservation. Let me yes. ask you, why didn't you look much more carefully at the electrical charge fluctuations since we do have tons of pions and it would be naively much simpler? Um, yeah, naively it would be much simpler. Um, well, there are so maybe I have one yes result with pions. It would be naively much simpler, but there are also some complications with pions. Like for instance, when you have resonance decays, and also when you can produce additional source of fluctuations for pions, and unless you capture a very large rapidity range for pions, you, that is something that then you have to correct for additionally, like for example, shown here. But also, um, well, the, the coupling of pions to the baryon 
number is not maybe is not as obvious and straightforward as that of protons that we want to use because we basically the signatures are mainly predicted for 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 the baryon number fluctuations but uh, yeah. we also keep track of other net particle number observables uh, and measurements and and there is uh, forthcoming work on on uh, yes on, on the behavior of these observables this would include net charges net, uh, net charge net k on net proton and uh, yeah and what the data shows and, and what the the space and calculations show and whether there are differences or not and um but what I can say that at LHC there is still there is I think interesting measurement which is not fully understood. They measure the so-called D measure. It's a net charge essentially variance, and uh, yeah, this measure it it has these issues related to resonance decays, which I mentioned. But even if we try to correct these issues, then the measurement of net charge fluctuations appears to be quite a bit below what we can obtain with, with uh, for example, cadron resonance gas picture with electric charge conservation and so on. And so, and I think that is something we still have to understand. Maybe it's not necessarily directly related to the critical point search, but but possibly for I don't know something like. Um, fractional charge carriers and so on. The idea suggested 20 years ago by Forkers and John, Uli and others. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, then uh, sort of uh, bouncing off your answer, the next natural mm -hmm. question, how about strangeness for the same mm -hmm. uh, reasoning like uh, baryon charge, it might be simpler. Uh, well, a strangeness, there are Okay, there are net there are kaons, right? Still lighter particles which carry strangeness. Uh, so not baryons. There are also hyperons, uh, which are less sensitive than protons. If you can look at lambdas and at the scales, then deviations from unity here are really minute compared mm -hmm. to protons. Um, but strangeness. Uh, I mean, they, there is strangeness conservation, there are strange hyperons, but it's again, it's not obvious why, yeah, why it would be more promising for the search for the critical point. But so I, the critical, but, but the data everything fluctuates. Like the, the everything fluctuates. Everything fluctuates, and basically, you have to see increase in those fluctuations for any conserved charge. It doesn't have to be baryonic. Yes, but. Uh, for baryonic, we expect the strongest signal, and if we cannot see it in baryonic, then it, 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 it starts to get challenging to see it in other observables, especially since there are all these other effects which contribute more strongly. But of course, we, we have to look at the data in its entirety that is available, and there are data available, for example, for all of the off-diagonal second-order susceptibilities of net pion, net kaon, and net charge number from weekly energy scan, and, and this is something which, uh, which has to still be analyzed. I see, I see. Any other questions? Any other questions from the audience? I don't see any raised hands. Uh, last very naive question that I mm -hmm. had. Um, when you go to those very small collision energies, who's saying that you are even approaching anything close to equilibrium or something that that could be characterized as a medium with uh, criticalities mm -hmm. and everything? If it's completely out of equilibrium, this this data would be simply meaningless, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it would be, we, know we, are, yeah. we are approaching any sort of equilibrium mm -hmm. at all? Yeah. It, 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 it's always a concern. I agree. I mean, we have on one hand some evidence that the spectra and the chemistry are described by models assuming equilibrium. On the other hand, what you are saying might be the explanation of the conundrum we observe here. I, I agree. This is, has to be better understood. But at the same time, this 
just the, the pure measurement where you have variance more than of more than twice larger than the mean is interesting and in itself and should be understood regardless of equilibrium. The simple suggestion is it's completely out of equilibrium. There is nothing equilibrated in the first place. And basically, then all that's off. Yeah, but there has to be a source of this non-Gaussian fluctuations, nevertheless. And even out of equilibrium, it's, well, what it's, could it it's be, true. right? It's true. It's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I don't see any raised hands, so let me use this opportunity to thank you, uh, Lloyd, again for a nice presentation, taking time to thank answer you. all the questions.